Welcome to the Education of a Financial Planner, where we look at the major concepts in financial planning through the lens of two quant investors who are learning the ropes of the planning process and how to help clients achieve their long-term goals. Learn along with us as experienced financial planner Matt Ziegler helps us understand the most important financial planning concepts that impact all of us and how we can apply them to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. In each episode, we will work through one major financial planning concept from the ground up and learn how we can apply it in the real world. From retirement to college savings to taxes to estate planning, we will cover a wide range of topics that apply to each of our everyday lives. We hope you will join us in our learning journey. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at the Lydia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. All right, guys, I think this year gives, and the performance of the market gives us an opportunity to talk about something that is probably always on a lot of investors' minds. Um, I think if you've been investing in the market, you know, the two things we're going to talk about today are something that because of the media and the way things with information, the way it's disseminated on Wall Street, you know, are always being put in front of investors and uh, is something that investors think a lot about. And that's one, where the market is going in the short run and the forecasts that are made by professional strategists on Wall Street. And then two, when it plays into this, the question of, and this is, we'll, you know, we'll get Matt's perspective, but I think we'll also have some insights, insights to share as, as to clients asking or investors asking, is now the right time to get invested, particularly in the market? Because if you've had some liquidity event, if you've made some change to a strategy, if you sold one of your funds, you know, there's always this question, is now the best time to get invested? And so, and that's a very important question. And it's one that certainly drives long-term returns. Um, and so we'll tackle that and we'll sort of try to talk to Matt about how he thinks about that and working with clients and families. And we can probably offer some perspective on that too. Um, but going back to this year, you know, it's interesting. So we effectively ended 2022 in a bear market. Many strategists were mostly negative on the market. Not all of them. I didn't have the time. I wanted to look at the Barons. Barons always does a year-end story, and they pro- provide a table of all the strategists' year-end targets. And you know, the vast majority of them were well below where the market is today. And 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 this kind of plays into the difficulty of predicting stocks and the performance in the short run. So you know, here we are um, through the second quarter. And the S and P is up, you know, roughly something like a little bit less than twenty percent. Nasdaq up thirty seven percent. Very few strategists were calling for those types of returns. And what's interesting, it's just crazy. Since like the end, you know, the markets kind of started at August sort of week here, and just like perfect clockwork, I've seen some of these strategists that were negative are now kind of capitulating and they're raising their targets for the S and P. So I mean, who knows what's going to happen between now and year end? But it just it just plays into the point about how difficult it is um, to, per, to you know, predict where the market is going in any 12-month period. And Jack, when we had um, Michael Mobison uh, from Morgan Stanley on, who's a, a super deep thinker on so many different things in investing, you know, we talked to him about this idea of base rates. And I, I sort of said, like, jokingly, oh, the market's going to be up, you know, X amount plus or minus a certain amount, given its, its its volatility. And he was like, Justin, that's the exact way to think about it. But yet no one actually does that when they're, you know, giving these giving these uh, year end market predictions. So I don't know, you know, I know we want to talk about base rates and kind of the importance of those. So do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, a few things. First of all, I think it's really important to understand, like, the more you do this, and we talked about this in our interview we just did with Adam Butler, the more you do this, the more humble you become, because you recognize the things that you cannot predict. And one of the things that you cannot predict is what the market's going to do in any given year. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many PhDs you have. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how much data you have. You cannot predict that. And it's very hard for all of us to accept that reality. You know, we all want to think we can be market forecasters. And that's why I write, I write a market forecast every year as a joke, basically, because I'm trying to hold myself accountable to the, for the fact that I can't predict it. And the only way to do that for me is to like put it out there and, and show how wrong it is. But so, so that's the first thing is I think it's, it's very important to understand what you can predict and what you cannot predict. And so on the base rates thing, you know, basically the high level thing with that is you've got something called the inside view and something called the outside view. 
And so the inside view is what everybody wants to do, which is I will take all the stuff that's out there. I'll look at the valuation of the market. I'll look at what's going on in the economy. I'll look at inflation. I'll look at all this stuff and I'll create a market forecast and I'll tell you where the market's going to go. That's what everybody does. Like if you look at any Wall Street bank that does this, that's what they're doing. They're, they're throwing all these things that make them sound smart together. They're ending up with a forecast. The outside view says, let, let's just look at what's happened historically. Let's not worry about all those facts. Let's just look at what's happened historically. And so you'd end up with something like with the outside view, you know, the markets return 10% a year, the standard deviation 15%. So 68% of the time or whatever it is, you know, I'll be between minus five and 25 or something like that. Now, it's, that's not perfect. A, a quant nerd like me will say the returns are not normally distributed, so it doesn't really work that way, but it's close enough. It's a rough approximation. So the point is you're going to get probably a better, you know, you're going to get a better outcome in terms of thinking about what might potentially happen by doing it the second way. Now, it doesn't tell you that much because telling me the market could be down 5% or could be up 25, like what, what am I going to do with that? That's not that useful. But that, that is a better way to think about it. And, and that just gives you an idea of the range of potential outcomes and that's only 68% of the time. So that gives you an idea of the range of potential outcomes for the market in any given year. And it gives you an idea of how hard it is to predict where it's going to fall within that range or outside that range. I think the most important thing, and I use this all the time, is I say with whenever we're talking about this, it's, it's the bifocals. And I think that's at the heart of Mobison. And quick shout out to my neighbor, Steve, who I think I berated with, hey, you've never read the base rate book the other weekend? And uh <laughs> If I had a nickel for every time I recommended the base rate book and probably ruined somebody's weekend, which you should, of course, go download because it's friggin' amazing and Mobison deserves to be a household name. So the bifocal view is like you have to be nearsighted and farsighted at any point in time. You And you need to respect that you need both of those things. You need to be able to read the page in front of you and also see down the road ahead of you, specifically if you're driving at night. The other way I always think about this for the market strategists when they come out circa fourth quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter with their annual year forecasts is I think about that great scene in the the Princess Bride where you have the battle of wits. Do you recall this epic? Oh scene yeah, in yeah it's with history? the poison. It's with the poison. With the, po the poison. <laughs> so you have to ask, and I'll just, the spoiler, everybody on the news making that forecast is a Vizzini, is a guy who is like, of course, Plato, Socrates, they're all morons. Like, yeah, of course, you have the confidence in this number. That's just a statistical game. You never want to be a Vizzini. You always want to be a man in black. And the only way to be a man in black, which is, I'm sure, a big part of what we're going to talk about, is knowing if you're immune to the poison without Vizzini knowing you're immune to the poison. So base rates, cool, bifocal view, have the ability to read what's in front of you, but also see for the long haul. If you can only see what's in front of you, if you only see long term, you're going to get messed up and never be a Vizzini. How do you handle questions from clients about this? Because back to my original point, as much as we all recognize we can't predict the market, we all think we actually can. It's like, it's like this, uh, you know, it's like this dichotomy here. So I would think clients a lot of the time would be like, well, look at this horrible thing on the horizon. Like something, you know, we got to do something here. Or look at this, you know, look at this positive development in AI. We got to do something here. So I, I would think like clients still oftentimes might think they can do some predictions. So how do you handle that when people ask you about that? I invoke the Daniel Kahneman quote first and foremost from the cover of the base rate book, which I guess we probably have to link to this. It's it's just that good. So the Daniel Kahneman quote from the cover of the base rate book is people who have information about an individual case rarely feel the need to know the statistics of the class to which the case belongs to. And when a client or somebody is asking about these things, the the, the specific individual case is what they feel. They want to have the market return or the market beating return. What we have to understand is at this point in time, how does that fit into the broader reference class of historic market returns with all the inputs, all the variables, all the things that make this year kind of rhyme with something in history or not at all? And it, it's a fool's errand to know what will happen next, but we think you can derive a lot of information by understanding the specifics around the individual in front of you, what they have going on, what their plan needs, and then where we are in various market cycles. Did, did that answer your question? Or did yeah, I no, that didn't answer my script? question. Okay. How, how do you think about these market forecasts though? They're, they're all over the place. You know, I mean, I know you worked at a big bank a while back. Um, like they're out there, you know, pe people are reading them. I mean, do you think there's any value in them? Do you, do you see any, I mean, obviously they have very, very detailed analysis. They got tons of charts in there. You know, if, if you read them, you're going to believe that they know what they're talking about. Like, how do you think about those? Well, still the, the most important 
uh, finance book probably ever is is definitely this one. I mean, if you haven't read How to Lie with Statistics, like you're only fooling yourself, right? So here, here's the thing about market forecasts and about those people on TV and all the beautiful charts. You got to step back, extra Mobison, and first see them as what they are, which is this is somebody who has to come up with a forecast because the game is coming up with the forecasts. And the first thing you do is go like, okay, let's, let's look historically. Um, before we even get into historical returns, the first question is, what are the odds that the market's going to be like up, down, or flat? And correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I want to say you have 60 to 70% odds that the next year is going to be an up year. You have maybe like 1% of that is, or 10% of that is like a flat year. And then there's like a, a or maybe it's 20, 20 to 30% is flat or down. Does that sound about right for like your annual odds of an up year? Yeah, yes. and what's what's really interesting about that though is that the odds of the return being close to the average are very very low. Oh, so if you think the average is ten, like the average of eight to twelve almost never occurs. So like people think, oh, here's my average return, ten percent. Like you almost never get ten percent. Oh, okay, so here's what's really cool about the forecast, and this is a game we could totally play this at the end of the year. Uh, I used to have a spreadsheet because I used to hate, literally hate. Like they would send this scorecard around at my old job, and they'll be like, "Here's all the street predictions for the year." And I'd be like. Here's, and so I had this game where I would deconstruct the street forecasts where I would go, okay, so here's the rolling, usually like 10 or 20 year annual return for say the S and P. And so here's the odds that it's going to be up. And to your point, you almost never get the average annual return. That is the historical average from the period. So the first thing you do is go, we're going to bet the market's going to be up. Here's the thing. If you're bearish, literally take the average annual return for the last call it like 20 years and cut it in half. If you're bullish, you can use the average return, and that's where most of them are going to cluster, approximately like 8 to 10% up for the next year. So you literally tick your, take your price right now in November or whatever, and you tack on 8 to 10%, and you go, there you go. That's how you get your annual return for the next year, and here's our price target. If you want to be bullish, you take the standard deviation, you tack it on to the top of the return expectation. And then because that would be foolish if you were like, I think the market's going to be up 25% next year, even though to your point, if it's up, it's not going to be up eight to 12. It's probably going to be up something bigger. So then what you do is you take that standard deviation, usually cut it in half. So if it's like, oh, I think the market's going to be up seven or eight and I'm wildly optimistic, I can literally go 25 to 50% above that target. And then that's where you get your bullish estimates. You look at it all that way, you get a fun little distribution of returns. It rhymes with a historical average. It's all Vizzini. It's all poison. Just stay away from it. It's not useful. My, my favorite forecasting technique, and we're going to give people some tricks here if they want to use it on Twitter, is you, you always forecast a 40% chance of a bear market. Always. Because basically, that's more likely than historically. So if you're right, you can say, well, I said there was a 40% chance. I called for an above average chance of a bear market. But if you're wrong, you can say, well, I thought there was less than a 50% chance of a bear market. So you basically cannot lose. So, so that's how you build your following is, is you just always forecast a 40% chance of a bear market. I love that because I also think in the tradition of poison, and I have a I have an embarrassing list of poison references that I put in my notes for this, I'm now realizing is, yeah, this is the ain't looking for nothing but a good time of Wall Street forecasts. <clears throat> And also, just so we don't bash the forecasters too much, I mean, I don't blame them at all for what they're doing. I mean, that, that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. I and mean, they're, they're facing a task that is almost impossible to do. So you can't go be head market forecaster at XYZ place and be like, you know what? I'm going to issue 10% plus or minus 15%. That's my market forecast. Like, you have to issue the forecast. You have to make your best. And these guys are all trying their best to predict what's going to happen in the market. And they're using, you know, very intelligent data in doing that. The problem is they're fighting a battle they can't win. They're trying to predict something that can't be predicted. An extra, extra emphasis on these people are not dummies. Like they know what they're doing. And for the most part, they're giving us the outside view. They're giving the broader reference class example of like, statistically, here's what we think is going forward. And to your point on the 40% recession odds, like here's all the safe bets. The role of most of those forecasters, the IMF, one of my other favorite examples of this and their forecast of GDP, it's not that the IMF is ever going to be right, but I always think of it as it's like, they're telling you what vanilla ice cream tastes like. They're not telling you what Rocky Road tastes like. They're not telling you what chocolate tastes like. They're not doing anything fun or exotic. They're just trying to define the standard for this is what we think is average for the next year. And that's an important part of market functions.
So for those listening on uh, audio, if you pop over to our YouTube channel, uh, we're going to have some good charts in there on the variability returns, what we just talked about. And also this, um, this next chart, um, which is a Howard Marks, the two by two matrix, which is kind of gets at this, you know, if you are going to predict the market, you have obviously consensus and non-consensus views, and then you can either get it right or get it wrong. And um, I mean, it, it's a really good way to think about when you you are hearing someone making a prediction, how you're actually going to make money on that as an investor. Most of the time, you need to be in the upper right-hand corner. It, you kind of got to take the non-consensus view and be right. If you take the non-consensus view and you're wrong or the consensus view and you're wrong, you're going to get it wrong. Or if you take the consensus view and you get it right, you might not get it. You might, you might make some money there. Um, Marx would say, you know, he's a very deep contrarian. So he wants to most of the time be taking the non-consensus view and get the prediction right. But that's just another way to think about, you know, when trying to make money off of these predictions or forecasts, sort of where you have to be in this two by two quadrant. And we'll put be putting those visuals in just so you guys can see them. I don't know if you guys have anything to comment on that, but want to mention this, that. This is the the AAA thing all over again, right? This is the averages in the middle, awesome and awful at your two ends. So if you're going to be willing to accept like average, like that's a consensus view by definition mm -hmm. is statistically average. If you're not going to be consensus, consensus, if you're going to be active, then you're playing the game of you can have an awesome or an awful outcome. And the most important poison perhaps of them all is the Bell Biv DeVoe poison, which gave us the great lesson of never trust a big butt and a smile because that girl is poison. And that is the awful side of active returns if there ever was one. So, and the other thing for me on this whole non-consensus and right thing is it's very important to understand what goes into the consensus. Like I always like to think about the smartest investors I know. I like to think about Bridgewater just running every, you know, massive amounts of computing power on every piece of data that's out there. That's the consensus, all of that together. Like I have to ask myself, if I'm going to be non-consensus, how am I going to be smarter than that? And when you look at it that way, a lot of times you get away from this idea of, well, I can be non-consensus and right about this, you know, high level market fact that, you know, that everybody is analyzing that I can somehow have some edge on that. It, it sort of reduces the amount the cases where you think you can have an edge when you look at it that way. Vanilla ice cream is really good. Like, do you want to compete with vanilla ice cream on the mass market or it great you want to do it in your house you're like i love reese's pieces and i love like a little neapolitan flavor mixed in or whatever you can do that home but like do you want to go compete against you know turkey hill or briars or whatever your local you know mass-produced ice cream is of choice like are you gonna launch a company and go compete for vanilla ice cream there <laughs> like it just exists this next topic there i, I love talking about this because there's so many misconceptions about this idea and this is the idea of dollar cost averaging so I'll rant about it later, but first I want to ask you, like if a, if a client comes to you with a chunk of money and says, do I invest this now? Do I invest half now, half later? Like, what do I do about this? How do you handle that situation? So I think, so the default answer and Nick Majuli and of dollars and data and, and all that stuff, there's, there's a lot of evidence for, especially with market investments, you just rip the bandaid off, you throw the whole thing in and everything, when you zoom out, it's not going to matter. Now, I think that's a great statistical argument, but I think behavioral that behaviorally that's really hard to digest. I, I learned this in my my big old bulge bulge bracket firm thing before. Um, we had we had like so you have your annual forecasts and that happens like in the research department, but then you have a different department for the actual like allocators and assumptions and everything else. And this rhymes with the way like Sunpoint approaches this, and this rhymes with the financial planning process we use inside of those as, as, assumptions that we make, we have basically some room for here's the average. And then are we running above average or below average? And what I would say is when somebody comes with a lump sum of money, and funny enough, I'm dealing with this with a number of clients this year, uh, in 2023, as of August, we are having basically an average to above average first half of the year. I think we can all agree with that statement. Would you guys agree? First half of 2023, not so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's been pretty good. 
Okay, so if you're coming to me with a pot of money today and it's been pretty good, what we're looking at is we're going, okay, we're running above average. When you're running above average, it tends to pay because the act of an inflow into a portfolio, meaning cash flow has generated a positive surplus in some way that now needs to be allocated on the balance sheet, we're going to tend to say like you can dollar cost average that amount. The further above average we are, the slower you're going to do. You're going to start some today. First deposit hits, we're going to start putting some money to work. But if we're running way above average, like we all know it's silly to just go charging into the markets, especially after like a 15 to 20% move. So just slow the pace of going in. It might take three or six months to go in. It should likely be less than a year. It should not be, we're going to time the bottom or buy the next dip. That's always a fool's errand because you don't know how short or how extreme that dip is. But if you just had a historic above average run, slow your roll on the way in. If you just had a historic below average dip, uh, had some clients like at the COVID lows who were like, this is terrifying, but they had this pot of money that came in for some, some stuff. It's like, no, don't dollar cost average. Once you have a 20% decline, if you believe in humanity, if you went from the nearsighted part of the bifocal to the farsighted part of the bifocal and we're like, oh yeah, uh, this storm didn't wash the road away, we can move forward, then you don't have to dollar cost average in the extreme scenario. So long-winded way of saying it depends, but unless the market is raging up, you can probably put it all in at once. If the market is raging up, take your time. You'll probably be happy you did. And do that across asset classes. Like stocks aren't the only thing you're buying. So don't forget that. This gets at the idea, the difference between theoretical and practical. And, and that's so important. Like it's probably one of my biggest lessons as an well investment said. advisor is <laughs> like theoretically, pretty much you get a lump sum of money you should invest in. There, there's, it's very hard to come up with a case. Like if you test it historically where you shouldn't just put the money in the market. But having said that, Someone comes to you with $100,000. They say, you know what? I'm, I'm worried about the market here. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I don't want to invest this right away. You invest this right away and the market goes down. You've got a major problem on your hands. So it's better to say in a case like that, even though theoretically it is wrong, it is better in that case to do what they want, which is, you know, but to do it systematically, try to have a process. Like if they come to you and say, I'm waiting for the 20% pullback to do it, like say, all right, that's not a very good idea, but let's do Pure this. Vizzini, like, pure right. Vizzini. If somebody right. says I'm going to buy the next dip. It's Vizzini, run. <laughs> right. Like you, but like you said, come up with some sort of systematic way. All right. We're going to do it at regular intervals, no matter what the market does or something like that. You know, even though that is theoretically the wrong decision, in, in a lot of cases, that is the right decision behaviorally and practically. Okay. So CC DeVille in the hit poison song, Unskinny Bop, which makes no sense. And as an adult having to look up, like, what are the words from that tape? Like literally unskinny bop makes no sense. It's a nonsense phrase, but it was a hit song. Everybody told him this makes no sense, but he was like, phonetically, this is awesome. And this is the idea. Like you have to go with feel on some of this and what feels right, but you have to have a process. You have to know what a good song is before you can say, hey, this unskinny bop thing makes sense and it's a hit. Unskinny bop just blows me away. Know. Yeah. We're back to Justin singing again. <laughs> uh, my tune is way another, off. Another, of that, I, another I hit like episode. <laughs> it's a great song, but it means nothing. <laughs> all the poison references. I, I forgot about all these great poison songs. Welcome to the rabbit hole. <laughs> maybe maybe a little Cinderella next time, Matt. See, see you do something <laughs> no, with that. Really pushing it, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the other tough thing, too, is, you know, uh, and I agree with everything you guys said, but the challenge is, you know, if you have an investor that you're going to dock down, you know, and you're down 20%, yes, that's a much better time to get in. But almost like behaviorally for them, it's almost a tougher thing because I think the fear gauge is elevated. So in their mind, it's like, oh, well, are we going down 20% to 40%? You know, if you had that type of correction in stocks, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, fear in the headlines. And so to your point, Jack, I think the systematic aspect of a plan is very important because the market could be up over the next six months or the market could be down. If the market's down, you absolutely want to be, uh, you know, buying when there's more value. But sometimes behaviorally, I think that's tougher for clients to actually accept. The, the man on this, and I know you guys have had Rob Arnott on the podcast, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Times. So go to Access. As I was going to say, I think it's multiple times. Go to the Access Returns channel, pull up a Rob Arnott interview. Did you guys ever talk to him about over rebalancing? Did that ever come up? I'm not positive. I don't think so, but I'm not positive. 
Okay. So one of the most useful ideas and in practice, something that we, we try very hard to do, but it doesn't present a ton of opportunities, but it does come up. And again, I want to make this point about if you have an injection of cash and you're like, do I invest the lump sum? Thinking about that in terms of rebalancing is really important because that respects that you have a model, it respects that you have an outlook, and it respects the act of adding money is just rebalancing the strategy at some level, even if it's a giant inflush of capital and it's inflow of capital, and it's going to change the whole composition of the balance sheet. And the reason is uh, to what you just said. So used to have this chart that I made up, maybe excess returns. You guys can make this chart for me if you want extra homework. It was basically investing after declines because when you have a 20% decline, it's really scary to put new money to work because you're already fixated on how much worse it could get. Think at the beginning of the COVID crash, when we went the first 10% down, the next 10% was like, I think the world's going to end everybody. That's what all the Vizinis were running around saying. But the reality is once you get that far below your average, because at like a negative 5% your decline, you're at a one standard deviation move below your average return, right? So had this chart that was basically like, once you're down five and you start dollar cost averaging in, and Rob Arnott's point about over rebalancing is you actually improve the length of time that you get back to even on like your lump sum portfolio. So the idea is the further below the average you get, irrespective of, of where you are below it, just the fact that you're below it means you'll close that gap faster back to average in the recovery period. Such a simple idea, but it's so hard in the moment to take that action, to choose to be the man in black who's going to play the game because you're like, no, oh no, I'm, I'm immune to this poison because I have this long-term view on markets. And just, just back to dollar cost averaging, I think this is kind of where I might rant about it, but this is, it's very important to understand like what dollar cost averaging is. Because one, one of the problems we have is, so if you say to an investor, dollar cost averaging, that is a very positive connotation. That works. That's an excellent strategy. But what we just talked about is not, to me at least, is not dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging is I take money that I don't have. I receive the money in my paycheck. I continue to invest every time I get more money. Dollar cost averaging is not I already have the money and I decide like how to deploy the money. So the second one or the first one, which is the one where every time I get my paycheck, I put some money away. I'm, I'm dollar cost averaging over time. There is that is 100 percent positive. Like there is no way you can argue against that. The other but people carry it across and they say, well, that's dollar cost averaging. So. The hundred grand I've got sitting in my account, like spreading that out over time is also positive. And that's the problem is you've got this term with a positive connotation and you've got this way that it's sort of been changed to something that it's not. And, and I think that's how people get tripped up with it sometimes. Jack, uh, I think you're talking dirty to me. That's what I'm hearing here. <laughs> I, I complete... Oh my God. <laughs> so, th thank you, Justin, uh... for acknowledging my voice, Justin. <laughs> um, no, I think that's super important and also related a version of that, the only bridge in between those two things that I'll point out is it is okay to say, because a lot of times we'll talk about you have your safe assets and you have your, your investment assets, or we call them your risky assets and your risk mitigation assets. And it might be where you go, we have so much in risk mitigation that we can weather a downturn. And therefore in a downturn, if you still have a salary coming in or you still have a, a surplus in your cash flow, we will literally have the conversation with a client COVID being the most recent example of this again, where it's like, okay, you've got, you're super conservative in the sense that you have 10 years worth of cash flow stocked aside in your risk mitigation assets. Do you want to take this and be opportunistic and dollar cost average away, rebalancing away from your risk mitigation into your risky assets to take advantage of this market dislocation? So that's the only bridge where I'll say there is a connection, but I agree I also hate when that word gets misused or misapplied just to like paper over some poor behavior or unsystematic behavior. One of the things you'll see a lot is when, when things are going really badly in the market or when there's really bad news out there, people are going to pick up the predictions. You have way more people on Twitter saying stuff, you know, the strategists are out talking more, the, the big bank strategists, like it, it seems like the amount of noise, you know, goes up a lot then. And I'm wondering just when you, when you think about with clients, I mean, do you hear from clients a lot more during periods like that? And, and how do you deal with it? So the first thing is you do hear from clients more. You always know which clients are going to be the ones you're going to hear from a lot more. And that's, that's where it's, it's extra important. And I think the other piece as an advisor, as a practitioner, we want to know who and how we're reaching out. Social media has made this a lot better. Things like this podcast make it a lot better. 
even though this isn't so timely per se in that like we're not giving commentary on what's happening this week. Sunpoint does it. We do these quarterly webinars where it's just the proactive outreach is what matters. Because when something scary happens, like we just went through this Fitch downgrade and I know people have questions about that. So it's who do we proactively reach out to and say, if this is on your mind, this is probably what you need to hear. And we don't want the market strategists to like make you feel like you're nobody's fool and nobody cares. And it's really important that, you know, you, you don't know what you got until it's gone, like your portfolio assets. And if Cinderella taught us anything, it's that, you know, you gotta, you gotta reach out for somebody to save you. I'm pretty sure it was Jim O'Shaughnessy in his Google talks presentation where he shares a story of, and I don't know if I have the name right, but like of this guy, uncle Ned, who was like, you know, sort of like a family friend, long-term investor with O'Shaughnessy. But every time the market, you know, had a 10% decline or whatever, like this guy would call up. And it was almost like a perfect like market timing tool in the sense that he was a perfect contrarian indicator. And, you know, to your point, Matt, it's like these clients that you know you're going to hear from. It's like oftentimes, at least in my experience, like that's usually, a, not always, but usually a sign that, you know, we're closer to a bottom of a correction or maybe bear market than, you know, than the beginning. Um, so we should all look for like the Vizzini's in our life, the, like the people who are great contrarian indicators. Cause I believe we all have great contrarian indicators in our lives. And that's the people, the uncle Ned's who will do something at the precisely like worst time, but will make the most noise out of it. And that's the power. I mean, Jack, that's why you write down the prediction at the beginning of the year, right? Like to almost like play off that, to humble yourself but remember those extreme views when, when you need to be reminded? Yeah, I think you're, you're, the way you remember history changes. And so the only way to know what you're actually thinking at the time is to actually write down what you're thinking at the time. And that was when we asked Tobias Carla, I remember when he was on the podcast, we asked him the one lesson he would teach the average investor, that was it. And, and I think I'm trying, I mean, I don't do as much of it as I should, but for me, particularly if I do it publicly, then it's like, I can't, I can't possibly misremember it. Like there's an article that's gonna sit there on the internet forever that says what I was thinking. And, and that to me, you know, that, that teaches me that I can't predict the market by having that sitting out there. I think that's one of the most important things, being humble about the changing nature of history. And I think it's also, it's, it's a huge part of my own upbringing as an investor, which is, I, this is why I care so much about things like sentiment. It's what are the overriding stories? You guys just did that excellent interview with Ben Hunt on applying narrative to investing. And I think it's that. It's narrative and investment have to be part of your your investment process and also your thinking process for those of us in the profession who talk to people about this stuff all day and take in information about this stuff all day, that's your discerning view. How do you unpack the narrative and the sentiment? Know that it's going to change all the time. One of my absolute favorite charts that, that Merrill Lynch Research publishes is they basically show from their investor survey, their institutional investor survey, what are the top concerns right now? And you literally watch things come up into consensus and then fade out into it. And they'll zoom out and show you over the last one, three, five years what those various things are. And beware always a consenting consensus. When everybody's saying the same thing, that's when the spidey sense has to tingle. Like there's poison out there. Somebody just doesn't know it yet. Yeah, that was the big point Ben Hunt made. And we, we talked to him on the podcast is like when the narrative becomes mainstream, when it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the big banks are telling all their clients about it, that's when you fade the narrative. You know, that's not when you want to get, you know, get into the narrative. That's when you want to fade the narrative. You want to get into it when it's just bubbling up, you know, below the surface. Absolutely. Reliably fade the consenting consensus. And if you just do that, that's that's the probably the best way to be active. And I think that's what Marx was getting at in, in his two by two matrix, too. And just one more point, going back to this idea of reaching out to clients during times of panic, it, it's a really hard thing to figure out. Like Betterment did some work around this. You know, they would send like they tested like sending an email to everybody, you know, like Fitch downgrades U.S., don't panic. And, you know, what they found is in most cases, what that leads people to do is panic. Um, so if like some people you need to reach out to during times like that, but other people are like, I didn't even know Fitch downgraded the U.S. Like, why, why are you telling me this? Now I'm panicked. So it's interesting trying to figure out like how to handle that. And it's probably different for every person. I love my favorite part about that is the worst, the worst side of behavioral finance is telling people how they're wrong and what their biases are and like some accusatory way that makes them feel shame or guilt or whatever. 
the best thing to do and the the gaff of the we're going to send you this blast email of these horrifying headlines is you can read the tone of these headlines even if it's saying don't panic at the end we all know what happens when somebody tells us don't panic we immediately start questioning should i be panicking what's going on here so the conversation is the most important thing and when we reach out to people proactively or if there's an inbound call and i had a couple people just reach out over the Fitch thing uh, yesterday when it happened and when this was news or what was going on with the markets. Why did this stuff swing so much? And it's like, okay, this is a bespoke conversation with this individual, with their own biases, preference, thoughts, ideologies, and we have to translate it back to what's in their best interest over the long term. And that's, that's what an advisor is supposed to be for. It's supposed to be that sounding board, that reflection, that way to step back and say, you know, I, I respect that your mama don't dance and your daddy loves rock and roll. And I can walk that line <laughs> and bring this together. <laughs> and, you know, one of the challenges, too, is like panic sells. And so, like, if you go like th this YouTube video won't get tons of views because we're trying to give a balanced view on this. We're trying to, you know, give people the facts. Like if we put a picture of a house on fire with Matt with like a shocked look on his face and like you know, Matt Ziegler calls for immediate, you know, meltdown in the stock market or something, that's going to get a lot more views. And so it's just as a consumer of this, you got to be careful that, you know, sometimes the stuff that's being pushed out to you that's at the top of your YouTube channel or wherever you watch things may, may not be the, the smartest stuff. It, it may be the stuff that, you know, gets the most engagement. I hereby propose, and I, I will wait for April Fool's if we have to for the episode, but I do propose my tinfoil hat advice episode where all I do is give the full panic mode <laughs> advice. We'll have because, to do it. Or at the very uh, least, we'll have to do the cover with, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but they, it actually has a name. They call it YouTube face. Like the, the oh, completely really? shocked face that someone has on a cover. Mr. Beast does it a lot. Like that's actually called like YouTube face. It has a name and it's been proven that YouTube face increases, you know, the number of the click through rate significantly relative to a cover that does not have YouTube face. So may, maybe at one point we'll have to, just as a joke, we'll have to do all three of us doing YouTube face and see if we get a better. Now, people will be very disappointed probably when they start listening to the podcast and, and hearing what we actually say, but maybe we'll see if it increases engagement. Well, so, since I make the covers, I'm proposing the uh, what five poison songs can teach you about market <laughs> predictions and dollar cost averaging. How do you like that? <laughs> I just don't want to lose Bell Biv DeVoe in that conversation because I think uh, without being named poison, they have contributed to the poison finance canon. Um, I'm glad we had this discussion. I think it's a, it's, it's a discussion that I think a lot of investors can learn from. Um, we talked about how difficult it is to predict where the market's going, um, the variability of returns, the importance of thinking about base rates and in investing. And then, Matt, thank you for sharing um, some of your thoughts on how you know you work with clients around this discussion. I think you know formulating good long-term plans, reminding clients that it's not about the next three to six months, that it's about thinking long-term. Um, but being open to, you know, listening to clients and this concept of dollar cost averaging, Matt, I love the rebalancing effect and trying to take advantage of that during, you know, different parts of the market cycle where things might be really high or really low. That's extremely powerful. It's something that we do with our clients and I've done with my personal portfolio. And um, yeah, the, the YouTube face uh, cover. What do you guys think? You want to try it? Well, yeah, maybe this is the time. We'll have to try it at some point and see what happens. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you guys very much for listening. We'll see you next time. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.